So um, good morning and welcome to this week's Friday Chalk Talk. Um, today is a two part of a multi-part series on the topic of race and medicine. Um, today's format is gonna be two, two parts as well. First, uh, Liddell and I wanna share a couple of our take home points from part one. And then second, almost all the rest of the time will be open for a group discussion. And what Liddell and I are hoping for are people to share stories for us all to get to know each other's perspective a little bit better, or perhaps lessons learned, or, or even perhaps ongoing questions and uncertainty. And so with that, I'll hand it over to you, Liddell. I'll follow, and then we'll open up the floor. Hey, um, good morning, everyone. Um, my, my aim for doing this with uh, Martin was simply to bring to the fore my perspective, I'm not a professional doctor, chaplain yet, I'm still a resident, but I have been to many hospital rooms. I have performed very many funerals. I have been to very uh, many hospital beds as a pastor, as an assistant pastor. I've done nursing home ministry for, for 20 years. And so I'm familiar with death. I'm familiar with uh, pain and suffering. Uh, just a little background. I, most of my family that migrated here from the South, uh, you know, the adults and their kids are gone now. So I've been to 55, 65 funerals of my own family. Um, not mentioning the people from church and stuff like that. I'm saying that because, you know, and I have my own personal history uh, with some bad, you know, medical uh, issues. Uh, so how do we start to address these? Martin brought up two cases um, on our last talk. I think one was a, a wife who was uh, losing her husband, and then uh, the second was a lady who uh, whose body was shutting down, her kidney was shutting down. And she you know, just didn't trust, trust the process because there were things that had happened in her past that stopped her from believing that doctors had her best interests at heart. And when we started to talk about these things, you know, I just got a chance to, you know, answer some of his questions. And then he got a chance to get my perspective on those questions. And the one thing that I came up with after summarizing in my own head after everything was over um, was this, no matter what race you are, in other words, we're talking about healthcare and race. Some people want to take that to mean, you know, it's just a black thing or black disparity or, or American Indian disparity or, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And that's not what this conversation was supposed to be about. I hope you didn't take it that way. Our, our focus was just race period because all people get sick, all people die. And all people have family, all people have, they get this bad news, you know, there's nothing else we can do for you. And so as a chaplain and as a pastor, I wanted to make sure that the medical profession at some point started to take what we do seriously. Because there are times when a doctor tells a patient, there's nothing else we can do for you. Uh, you might have three weeks to live. We go to a higher authority, at least the people that I know, and it's not just black people. White people have you know the same God or gods, or Hindu people, or you know, uh, Islamic people. So this thing has to be about how do we add that spiritual component into healthcare, not as a, a last resort, but a first resort. That's how I see it, so. Beautiful, beautiful. Um. So yeah, this is a huge topic. And so I plan to limit, I wanted to limit myself to just fleshing out one, <clears throat> one take home point that I didn't, you and I haven't talked about before in the dental. Um, so I am an inpatient consultant. So I only get to see patients when uh, teams 
that consult me see value in me being involved. Or put another way, I don't get to play in the sandbox unless I'm invited to play in the sandbox. Um, so when I look at any topic, I try and view it from the lens of how am I helping the person that is consulting me? And certainly that's not the only consideration, but it's an important one. And so from the lens of the person consulting me, they're asking me for help. And sometimes that's from distress or frustration about patients who are making choices that they don't understand and they don't agree with. And race is one of many aspects of a person that impacts some of those decisions. So I think the more that I can understand about why, and I preach this all the time to the fellows, I don't, I don't care what somebody's doing, I wanna know why they're doing what they're doing. But the more I can understand why a family is making the choices that they are, the more I think I can help the team that consulted me to understand it as well. And oftentimes I think just understanding another's perspective, it really helps to lower our colleagues' distress. And so I really have appreciated your candor, Liddell, with me, because when you and I have been talking about this for a handful of months now, and um, I think the more that I, the more than I can appreciate what some folks might maybe coming from, the more I can help everybody else as well. And, you know, um, I'm grateful uh, to palliative care for what they've taught me. Um, uh, that day we got a chance to round at Luke's and uh, Dr. Gale and Dr. K here. Uh, you know, giving people options when they've gotten the worst news of their life is so important. Uh, you guys give people options. And, and sometimes, like you said uh, on our last talk, that it, it may not be curable, but there's always things we can do. Well, I, I, I feel the same way about spiritual care. I really do. There are things that we can do. I'm sorry that doctors cannot do. <laughs> that nurses can, it just, it just is. And so, and to try to eliminate that, to always make this just a clinical endeavor is denying the humanity and the spiritual aspect because everybody, uh, according to uh, uh, Chaplain Lex, everybody has a spirit, right? Whether whether you believe in God or not, there's still a human spirit, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody has a spirit to be attended to. Chaplaincy, I don't think get the respect that it should get mm -hmm. because it's it's looked at. You know, what one of the things I had trouble with early on in in my residency was taking pastoral authority, feeling part of the team. You know, you walk, you know, you, you just start, right? You walk into Luke's, you walk into NICU or CVICU, and they look at you like, who are you? You know, you got your badge on, <laughs> you know? And, you, you know, it's kind of like, why are you here? You know, that's that's how I felt. No one embraced me and said, hey, hey, chaplain. You know, we have someone that we think, you know, there's some banner, the past, a, a patient with a, a violent banner. Do you, do you wonder if you think you could, you know what I mean? That we're not consulting. Like you're consult, like they bring you in. And when they do, it's usually for something death, you know what I mean? Or bring us a Bible. We're more than bring a Bible people. We, we deal with emotions. <laughs> we deal with uh, uh, how people process information. We deal with feelings. We we deal with those tangible, uh, those intangibles that doctors don't normally get a chance to deal with, and so to, to negate what we bring to the table, um, I think is, is is a mistake. I'm talking about you know. So when you see a chaplain hit the floor, it should be, why are you here? It you know, or we paged you? No, uh, you know, there's a patient that I know is having a even if you don't know the, the chaplain, you know, engage him, you know, as doctors, as professionals, as nurses, because we can help in areas, especially when you're having a, a hard time with a patient and you have to deliver bad news and you don't know how that's going to turn out. I know traditionally that's not what has been done uh, in medicine. I mean, I know, you know, we're here for the death thing. I get it. 
but there's so much more to chat once you do that. Yeah, yeah. And that's why we love you so much. <laughs> Palliative care appreciates chaplains more than more than you know. Right. But so let's let's open it up for discussion. Um, I know I was chatting with Ruth a bit earlier. You want to you want to chat first, Ruth? Sure, sure. Uh, first, I want to thank Liddell and Dr. Bazelik for the discussion you posted last month on race and healthcare. Liddell, thank you for the generosity of your spirit uh, in sharing your experience and expertise as a black man, a chaplain, and a pastor. The gift you're giving us, especially the white people present, will help us, the white community, to build a new culture where white bodied supremacy is dissolved and all people, especially black, indigenous, and all bodies of culture are respected and honored. You said something in the video that stayed with me, and it was about trust and how important it is to build trust. So the story I share has to do with, with trust. I joined one of our palliative care doctors in a visit with a patient recently uh, whose health was uh, deteriorating and decisions need to be made regarding goals of care. Before the visit, uh, I learned that it was really tough to communicate with this person. The team had tried multiple times to, to get them to understand, but there, there just wasn't movement. The patient wasn't really acknowledging the situation as we saw it and the need for any decisions to be made. I, happened, I just happened to be on the floor and was invited to join. And so I thought to myself, what a great opportunity to watch palliative care in action and also provide an additional calming presence in the room. And I thought I might be able to help. We went in and the palliative care doctor tried to explain things to the patient, but they just weren't interested. They kept repeating what they were interested in. And that was their concern for their daughter and her financial needs in reference to being the patient's uh, uh, personal care provider. So I could feel the patient's agitation uh, when uh, questions kept being asked that didn't have to do with that. And so I stepped in and, and I reflected and I affirmed what the patient was saying. So the patient seemed to relax somewhat. Um, and so, so that, that was like, okay, that's good. There's, there's uh, just affirming and reflecting. You know, anytime a decision about something was offered, the patient got frustrated again. So I could, I could feel the, the energy going up and coming down. And I wanted, I wanted to help, you know, we, we, of course, we wanted to help the patient. Uh, and I wanted to help the palliative care doctor help the patient by getting the patient to understand that these options, uh, uh, that we weren't trying to push anything. Um, the reality was the patient wasn't in a place to make decisions. And we were stuck because we, we just wanted to help. So what I learned in that moment was keep affirming and reflecting what the patient is saying, what the patient is expressing what their needs are. Uh, and that, that helped relax the patient, which, which to me felt like more trust was being built and to let go of my desired outcomes uh, in this particular situation. That's good, Ruth. Uh, and I think that's one of the things we bring to the table, you know, uh, as chaplains. And that's what I'm learning uh, in these five, six months, you know, and even as a pastor who visited many bedsides, who performed many last rites for some of our church members, you have to understand that the person dying is the person that's important. <laughs> and, and, for what you did for that person. I don't know if they're still here or not. You know, I don't know how far that situation went, but what you gave them was some peace of mind in the midst of chaos. Well, for, for that particular moment, but then I, you know, I, I'm not sure if I was clear enough, but I also was trying to help the patient make decisions. Other, you know, I was trying to help them but that's not what they wanted in that moment. Yeah, and, and so, but you saw that is what I'm saying. You, you saw that. 
That's the that's the point. That's what chaplains bring to the table. You have, I want to do that, but you tend it to the patient's needs. That's what ministry does. We tend to needs. We don't necessarily tend to the other stuff. Our first priority is to pay is the patient what they need, and what they needed at that moment was for you to affirm what they what was important to them: their doc, uh, their daughter, their finances. And then you got to a point where you stayed there. You 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 wanted to do something that you. That's not where they were. <clears throat> that's important, Ruth. It is. That's that's as pastors, that's what we do all the time. I think that brings up a really good point of how we really do need to sometimes remember what patients focus on. Um, you know, all us medical folks, as, as a nurse practitioner, I'm guilty of this. We think that what's happening in that moment with that person's physicality is the most important thing happening. And so many patients are, are trying to think two, three, four steps ahead, right? They've got maybe a loved one at home who's ailing or, you know, they're thinking about, boy, after I get out of here, how am I going to get transportation to all these doctor's appointments they're telling me about? And I think that that's something that we oftentimes forget. And what my experience has been, has been with utilizing the interdisciplinary team to figure that out. You know, that's, that is where chaplains, social workers, you know, folks that are able to kind of wrap their head around the holistic thing and help that patient through those two, three, four steps ahead to take, uh, to alleviate some of that anxiety. Um, and to make sure we're just addressing the things that are on their minds. And then if we can address that, then maybe we can talk about the physical stuff. You know, you can eventually get there as long as you are respectful and um, helping them process. Rose, great point. Because remember in the first uh, part one, I talked about when you give people your dying news, everything spins out of control. That's why I believe a chaplain needs to be in the room even before you get ready to do it. Just, that's my personal opinion. Or their clergy, you know, you know what I mean? Uh, because you tell them that their life is ending, everything about them, if, if they have a wife, if they have children, grandchildren, everything about that family is going to change significantly. And you need that spiritual component uh, in the room. I, I just believe, I, I'm not saying that everybody should agree with this, I'm saying from what I've seen over the last, since 1999, when I got ordained, till now, I've been in enough deathbeds to know that when you're gonna tell someone, you know, you don't give last rites, or you're gonna tell someone, you know, your life is gonna end in three weeks, three months, six months, they, and they need, they need someone spiritually to help them process that. And then, like you said, get through the steps because their mind is racing now. Someone to help slow it down. And to me, that's what Ruth did for that patient. And that's what uh, I've, I've saw Dr. Marty do it for a patient that we saw in, uh, in, uh, in Nisley, you know, for a few months back. And so, once again, whether it's white, Hispanic, American, Indian, people are dying and people have issues. And that spiritual component is what I'm really trying to focus on here because the medicine is always there. They're in the hospital. They're getting aspirin. They're getting oxycodone. They're getting, you know, uh, IV. That's there. What's not, what's not being taken care of? A chaplain might hit the floor and see how many patients in a day. How many patients don't get any spiritual care in a day? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people sick. Once again, it's just my personal opinion, uh, but I know there's some validity to it. Yeah. Or at the very least, offering it for folks who, who, who want it, meeting people where they're at. Because yeah. we, we, we recognize that not everybody, not everybody is looking right. for that. So, yeah. yeah. 
Thank you, Bruce. Anybody else? I have a question for you, Liddell. <clears throat> um, you uh, mentioned that um, you know the role of the chaplain um, in palliative care should be, um, you know, or that that the chaplain should be involved uh, earlier than than later. Um, question I have is. Um, you know, as far as timing, um, uh, to what what role would a chaplain have, let's say, prior to um, a patient uh, making a decision what option they wish to pursue as, as far as hospice and, or, um, you know, comfort care? And uh, what can the chaplain do in that phase? And let's say, how does that differ from, let's say, after they make a decision that um, which option they wish to pursue? Um, you know, that let's say they decided on comfort care. Does the chaplain's role uh, change in, in, in either of those phases? It can, according to the patient. What does the patient want? Beforehand, I think rounding is important. I really do. You, you, you know, you see what I'm saying? Rounding is important. So as we round on units, we're trying to develop trust and relationships with people uh, because they might come in the hospital today to take a test. They may not get the results of the test for three days, but they're there in the hospital. So three days later, now they get, well, you know, you have terminal cancer of the pancreas and, you know, you might have, three weeks to, to live. <laughs> the rounding beforehand, and now they say, you know, I've never even thought about a chaplain or spiritual care, but nurse, could you call the chaplain for me? And then we go in and we help them process information. We help them deal with the inevitable, but we also get give them a chance to, you know, to share their feelings. Uh, to confess anything that they've done that, you know, might hinder where they think their, you know, their God, their uh, uh, spiritual relationship with God might be. Help them to process uh, 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 mending relationships with family members in that moment. There, there's just so much that can be done. We help to give options, just like palliative care, but ours are more spiritual in nature and or psychological and or uh, uh, emotional. So we help to triage those things. And I think having somebody be able to rest in peace is important. It's about the patient for me. So if the patient requests uh, a, a chaplain, then that's when I go in and then I'm gonna let them lead the conversation mm -hmm. so they can tell me what they want because at the end of the day it's still about what they want i'm not going to tell them what they want i'm not going to try to even hint that i know what it is they want or need but what i'm going to do is just go in there and support them and just be in the room you know mm -hmm. i might start talking about a bucks game you know or if they start you know talking about their grandchildren you know i'll start asking about that they got a bad relationship uh, with their wife, I'll talk about that. Whatever they want to talk about is what I'm going to talk about because how they die is their choice. I'm not there for that. Okay. I'm just not. I'm there to help them before they die, figure out the things that are important to them because that their legacy is important. That's what we're there for, is to help them process that. That's it in my mind. Okay, well, thank you, Liddell. Liddell, um, I wondered, um, I, I will confess that I didn't get to listen to the first episode, so if this is repetitive, I apologize. Um, but so much of what I'm hearing you talk about is, and, um, um, is kind of um, the importance of holistic care and um, chaplains as um, part of that approach to caring for the whole person. 
And I'm wondering, um, you know, and, and that is, I think, why we, um, what we do couple so wonderfully with what palliative care does. Um, and I'm wondering um, what you see our role as, as um, spiritual care providers or palliative care providers in, um, in engaging with the health disparities that we come across every day in our work. Look, that's, that's good. Um, we do know that in race, uh, people who are non-white uh, don't necessarily receive the same type of uh, care. Uh, they may not re receive, uh, if said they're in pain, they may not receive oxycodone uh, where a white patient might receive that, but they might only get acetamipin, you know, 500 milligrams. That's not taking care of their pain level, you know, and for whatever reason, the doctors or whatever don't want to do that kind of stuff. So if they call us, because we got, we got to remember, our role is always like Dr. Martin's. We're invited <laughs> to the party later, you know, <laughs> but if we round, just knock on doors, how you doing, how you feeling, we get a chance to get more information because the one thing that Dr. Martin can't do is just go knock on the door and say, how you doing? At least that's not what I'm understanding. He said he has to be invited. We can do a little bit more than that. We can kind of invite ourselves at least to the door. And if they don't want to see us, then we can walk away. In that, in, in that moment, they might say, well, I'm in a lot of pain. And what do we do? We'll, we'll, we'll go to the nurse's office and say, hey, uh, this patient says you're in a lot of pain. What's, what's, what's going on? And now that I'm understanding my pastoral authority and chaplaincy a little better, I know I can go on the chart now and take a look to see what's happening. And if that situation needs advocating for, for you know, I can even go speak to the doctor. I didn't know I could do that before, you know, and say, hey, what do you plan to do? this patient is really suffering, they're moaning, you know what I mean? I didn't understand I, I had that authority as a resident where I could do that. Now I, I'm starting to get it. So I'm saying, how do we, or to ask your question, how do we uh, advocate for people? We advocate for people by meeting them right where they are, knocking on doors, asking them how they're doing. If they invite us in and give us their story, then we can help. If they don't, there's really not much we can do. We have to go to the next room. I mean, that's pretty much, all we can do. But I think that's a lot because they're looking for some help and they're not getting it from healthcare in the way that they want to see it at that particular moment. It don't mean that the doctor's going to change the medication, but it does mean that we addressed it to a point where the patient is satisfied with the work that we provided or, or the care that we provided for them. And I think that's the other side of spiritual care. Uh, it's not, it's not more, it's not just medicine, but it's the advocating, it's the, you know, the praying, it's the, you know, uh, psychological evaluation, it's the emotional care. It, we bring a lot to the table and all of that is important, no matter what race you are. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ladell. Thank you. And uh, Martin, hi, friend. How are you? Good morning. <laughs> thank you very much. I... Uh, uh, thank you for, I mean, uh, trust, yes. And uh, as a matter of trust, I want to thank you, Martin, for uh, that. Uh, that was a good call, you know, when you asked me about that uh, Spanish-speaking woman. Mm. And uh, I mean, right on, you know, here was the example of uh, when the team, many in the team were thinking and judging, oh, this person is done. She wants to die. Oh, my God, far from the truth and you just wanted to know and i mean is that the case because i don't think so so when i went and yes she's using oh me quisiera morir oh y que cansada estoy but i mean sometimes you know that's i mean, I mean like sometimes i say i want to die just because at that very moment i'm not feeling very well <laughs> but sometimes um uh even uh when it comes to race and, and in my case culture and language you know, we have to, and it is, it is hard because I have uh, sometimes like done the easy way going to see, uh, uh, having to use a, 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 a 
what do you call these things? Uh, in computer interpreter uh, through the computer. And uh, I mean, it's, it's easy uh, for me when it's English, but when it is Japanese and when it is, uh, I, I, I have to pay the same attention and, 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 and give the same uh, care. And uh, we, uh, you know, when it comes to language, I remember this woman who was, the team gave her something in Spanish, I didn't know. And so she was so, so uh, overwhelmed and she says, no entiendo, no entiendo esto, I don't understand. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, they gave it to you in English? I said, no, está en español, it is in, in Spanish, but I don't get it. And sometimes, you know, there are concepts that, that other cultures don't like uh, hospice, like you, you say hospicio in Espanol, but hospicio is nothing that uh, comfort care. There are so many concepts that are alien to, to some of these cultures. And so we need to pay the time. I just wanted to say, I think it's so integral to our, uh, like Caitlin said, our holistic patient care that we really do reach out to our chaplains and involve them. And as a person who's been a patient and been an observer in patients' rooms where you see all these specialty people go in and out of a room, you know, 10 people in and out of a room. And at the end of the day, the patient, you sit down with the patient or their family and they're like, I don't even get what just happened? I need someone just to listen to me for five minutes to help me process what I was just told. I think it's so important that we have the, the chaplain's spiritual support uh, along with our palliative exploring and supporting of our families and their goals. Rachel, I, I appreciate that observation because that's all what I'm saying. I've been a patient. I was, I was a patient at Loops in 2017 uh, there for some issues with my with my lungs, right? Uh, my doctor, is, he actually is in the number two, I think, professional building, right? And so, but he did a workup on me, man. I was there for three days. They ran every test that they could. In the meantime, I actually, I believe it was uh, Betty was actually on and she came to see me. I don't think she even know it. Um, and so, <laughs> Betty came to see me and, and she just talked to me, just you know, grounding, right? Just asked me how I was doing. And uh, so we got to talking about chaplaincy because you know, I, I was a pastor at that time, young pastor. And, you know, I was interested in chaplaincy. So she gave me Michelle's number, you know, while I was being a patient. I, and that, that's how I mm -hmm. actually came to know Michelle. And I made a phone call to Michelle from the hospital bed inquiring about chaplaincy uh, and because I wanted to know more. And, and, and what I'm saying is, is that had she not done that, I probably would have never did it. But what I really liked was her bedside manner. She didn't come in there trying to, as they say, proselytize or trying to convert me or trying to, you know, even search out anything about my life. She just came in there to be with me. And I think, I think when we understand how important that is, you know, um, to be with somebody, you know, <laughs> I've had all these tests. I hadn't gotten my results back. So I was alone on edge. You know what I mean? I wouldn't tell nobody that, but I was. And so as a black man, uh, it helped me to calm down, you know, doing that process, doing that waiting process. And I'm, and I'm hoping that from this conversation, uh, that palliative care doctors, doctors, nurses, what, that you start looking at chaplains as real team members. I mean, you know, someone you would call right away instead of someone you would call later in tough situations. But that's just, you know, me advocating for, for our craft, so. That's it. All right. Chandra, you wanna finish us up? Hi, I'm, ch oh, hi. I can't tell if my video is on. It keeps yeah. coming on and off. Oh, there I am. There you are. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I love this conversation, not just because um, I am a palliative care nurse practitioner, but I do also um, have experience as a faith community nurse and a licensed minister. And so I have a really um, grand appreciation <laughs> for the spiritual care team. And I think that I do a lot of work too with 
with the physician teams, with um, with the nursing staff, um, and like everybody that I come in contact with to remind them to call the chaplain. And sometimes on purpose as a matter of teaching, um, I'm a little sneaky in how I move. And so what I'll do is if I ask them to page the chaplain because somebody wants prayer or spiritual support or emotional support or whatever it is, um, I may take the time to sit at the desk and do my charting. And then if it's been 10, 15, 20 minutes and I'm like, did you pay the chaplain? You know what I mean? I'm always making sure. And they're like, oh, well, I was doing da, 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 da. Right. But I need you to understand that that's, an, that's a whole person in there, you know? And so we need to meet all of those needs. And no matter how spiritual I may have come into the room, that's not my role, you know? And even though they can invite us into that experience, I want them to understand that, you know, I don't always present the chaplain as only spiritual. I remind them that this is support, that this is probably the, like even in the community, they view the chaplains as the most neutral part of our whole healthcare team because they see them as having nothing to gain and nothing to lose by their interaction. And so even with the woman you guys were talking about earlier who was more focused on what was going on with her daughter, sometimes it's just inviting somebody in who has the insight to say, well, well, what needs to happen for your daughter? Like, what do you need to see happen for your daughter before you can be comfortable enough to focus on you? What can we help you do for her? What kind of moves can you take where it's okay for us to start talking about you? You know, and the chaplains can kind of break through that ice. Like he was saying, you know, there's certain truths and confidentiality that comes with being with them. You know, they can shut the door and say, just tell me, you know, without thinking, because they think everything they say to us, we're going to put it in the chart. And then it becomes a problem. And they're like, but I thought I could trust you. And so I, I, I agree. It's not just about the dying process, you know, because we are all nobody gets out of life, life alive, right? So we're all gonna go. So it's not as much about how they're dying in a particular moment. They're trying to tell you that this is about how I'm living. And so I think we need to refocus like how we, how people define suffering, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's what I was getting out of what he was saying earlier, you know, stop pressing just the treatment part and hear me when I say, that choosing that treatment doesn't mean that I'm choosing to die or that I'm choosing to suffer. It's not suffering if, if it's what I'm willing to do to live and that you don't get to say that. And the chaplains have that unique role to really partner with people and making their needs clear. And so I, I am always gonna be an advocate for getting the chaplain in early. And I always ask people, even at the beginning of every single consult, do they have any faith beliefs that we need to honor? Do you have your own pastoral care that you wanna involve in this process? And if not, is it okay if we involve ours? And so I, I, I am team chaplain all day. Um, and I think that quality of life has to, has to be whatever a person says it is. So whatever we can do, if there's education, if there's something that needs to be rolled out, if we can do anything to, you know, bring better chaplaincy, you know, um, advocacy here at Trinity, just let me know. I, I partner with our chaplains all the time. Wow, that, that, that was that's the dynamic right there, because that's, that's the point. Uh, we help people live until they die. Mm. Absolutely. Right? Mm. And, and it's about living until you die. It's not about you're going to die. It's, it's how can I help you live well, right? Until mm -hmm. you die. And if we can do that, uh, and, and if that's just taking their mind off the dying process and give them something else to think about besides dying, uh, you know, like, like you said, how can I help my daughter? How can I help my grandkids? Is my will in the order? Is you know mm -hmm. uh, is my burial uh, is are these things important? Is my uh, uh, obituary in order? You, all these there's there's a lot of things that can happen in that moment when the chaplain is in the room with patients who are facing end of life but haven't died yet, and that's mm. why and, and that's why I love Martin because he always presents options, and I think that's our role as well is to give patients options as an end prayer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Those are perfect last words, Chandra. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, guys. Thank you all for sticking around. We'll see you all next Friday. Have a wonderful weekend. Have a good one. Thanks, Bye. Take care. Bye.